I'm going to begin this Sunday upload a little differently than I normally do. I'm going to begin with just an excerpt from Chesterton's uh, seminal work, The Catholic Church and Conversion, which I have part one of actually on this channel, and at some point in the future I'll do the second half of it. But first I'm going to begin with this before getting into a medium-length essay of his. And that would be, well, and for obvious reason, I think, yesterday was the Assumption of, of the Blessed Virgin Mary, and many of you will be observing that today at your Masses. So I'm going to begin just with this short excerpt, and it comes, for, again, from the Catholic Church and Conversion. The honor given to Mary as the Mother of God is, among a thousand other things, a very perfect example of the truth to which I have recurred more than once, that even what we may call the Protestant truths were only saved by Catholic authority. Among these is the very necessary truth of the subordination of Mary to Christ, as being, after all, the subordination of the creatures to the Creator. Nothing amuses Catholics more than the suggestion, and so much of the old Protestant propaganda, that they are to be freed from the superstition called Mariolatry, like people freed from the burden of daylight. All the spontaneous spirituality, as distinct from the necessary doctrinal orthodoxy, is on the side of the extension and even excess of this cult. If Catholics had been left to their private judgment, to their personal religious experience, to their sense of the essential spirit of Christ and Christianity, to any of the liberal or latitudinarian tests of truth, they would have long ago have exalted Our Lady to a height of superhuman supremacy and splendor that might really have imperiled the pure monotheism in the core of the creed. Over whole tracts of popular opinion, she might have been a goddess more universal than Isis. It is the authority of Rome that has prevented such Catholics from indulging in such mariolatry, the strict definition that distinguished between a perfect woman and a divine man. Again, that is an excerpt from G.K. Chesterton's The Catholic Church and Conversion. Mary and the Convert by G.K. Chesterton I was brought up in a part of the Protestant world which can be best described by saying that it referred to the Blessed Virgin as the Madonna. Sometimes it referred to her as a Madonna, from a general memory of Italian pictures. It was not a bigoted or uneducated world, did not regard all Madonnas as idols or all Italians as redacted slur for Italians, but it had selected this expression by the English instinct for compromise, so as to avoid both reverence and irreverence. It was, when we came to think about it, a very curious expression. It amounted to saying that a Protestant must not call Mary Our Lady, but he may call her My Lady. This would seem, in the abstract, to indicate an even more intimate and mystical familiarity than the Catholic devotion. But I need not say that it was not so. It was not untouched by that strange Victorian evasion or translating dangerous or improper words into foreign languages. But it was also not untouched by a certain sincere though vague respect for the part that Madonnas had played in the actual cultural and artistic history of our civilization. Certainly the ordinary, reasonably reverent Englishman would never have intended to be disrespectful to that tradition in that aspect, even when he was much less liberal, traveled, and well-read than were my own parents. Certainly, on the other hand, he was entirely unaware that he was saying my lady, and if you had pointed out to him that, in fact, he was generally saying a my, a my lady or the my lady, he would have agreed that it was rather odd. I do not forget, and indeed it would be a very thankless thing in me to forget, that I was lucky in this relative reasonableness and moderation of my own family and friends, and that there is a whole Protestant world that would consider such moderation a very good, spirit, poor-spirited sort of Protestantism. That strange mania against Mariolatry, that mad vigilance that watches for the first faint signs of the cult of Mary, as for the spots of a plague, that apparently presumes her to be perpetually and secretly encroaching upon the prerogatives of Christ, that logically infers from a mere glimpse of the blue robe the presence of the scarlet woman, all that I have never felt or known or understood, even as a child, nor did those who had the care of my childhood. They knew nothing to speak of about the Catholic Church. They certainly did not know that anybody connected with them was ever likely to belong to it, but they did know that noble and beautiful ideas had been presented to the world under the form of this sacred figure, as under that of the Greek gods or heroes. But while putting aside all pretense that this Protestant atmosphere was actively an anti-Catholic atmosphere, I may still say that my personal case was a little curious. I have here rashly undertaken to write on a subject at once intimate and daring, a subject which ought indeed by its own majesty 
to make it impossible to be egotistical, but which does also make it impossible to be anything but personal. Mary and the convert is the most personal of topics because conversion is something more personal and less corporate than communion, and involves isolated feelings as an introduction to collective feelings, but also because the cult of Mary is, in a rather peculiar sense, a personal cult, over and above that of a greater sense that it must always attach to the worship of a personal god. God is God, maker of all things, visible and invisible. The mother of God is, in a rather special sense, connected with things visible, since she is of this earth, and th through her bodily being, God was revealed to the senses. In the presence of God, we must remember what is invisible, even in the sense of what is merely intellectual, the abstractions and the absolute laws of thought, the love of truth, and the respect for right reason, and honorable logic in things, which God himself has respected. For as St. Thomas Aquinas insists, God himself does not contradict the law of contradiction. But Our Lady, reminding us especially of God incarnate, does in some degree gather up and embody all those elements of the heart and the higher instincts, which are the legitimate s shortcuts to the love of God. Dealing with those personal feelings, even in this rude and curt outline, is therefore far from easy. I hope I shall not be misunderstood if the example I take is merely personal, since it is this particular part of religion that really cannot be impersonal. It may be an accident or highly unmerited favor of heaven, but anyhow it is a fact that I always had a curious longing for the remains of this particular tradition, even in a world where it was regarded as a legend. I was not only haunted by the idea while still stuck in the ordinary stage of schoolboy skepticism. I was affected by it before that, before I had shed the ordinary nursery religion in which the mother of God had no fit or adequate place. I found, not long ago, scrawled in very bad handwriting, screeds of an exceedingly bad imitation of Swinburne, which was, nevertheless, apparently addressed to what I should have called a picture of the Madonna, and I can distinctly remember reciting the lines of the hymn to Prosper to Prosper pin, out of pleasure in their role and resonance, but deliberately directing them away from Swinburne's intention, and supposing them addressed to the new Christian Queen of Life rather than to the fallen pagan Queen of Death. But I turn to her still, having seen she shall surely abide in the end, goddess and maiden and queen, be near me now and befriend. And I had obscurely from that time onwards, the, the very vague but slowly clarifying idea of defending all that Constantine had set up, just as Swinburne's pagan had defended all he had thrown down. It may still be noted that the unconverted world, Puritan or pagan, but perhaps especially when it is Puritan, has a very strange notion of the collective unity of Catholic things or thoughts. Its exponents, even when not in any rabid sense enemies, give the most curious list of things which they think make up the Catholic life, an odd assortment of objects such as candles, rosaries, incense. They are always intensely impressed with the enormous importance and necessity of incense. Vestments, pointed windows, and then all sorts of essential or unessentials thrown in any sort of order. Fasts, relics, penances, or the Pope. But even in their bewilderment, they do bear witness to a need which is not so nonsensical as their attempts to fulfill it, the need of somehow summing up all that sort of thing, which does really describe Catholicism and nothing else except Catholicism. It should, of course, be described from within, by the definition and development of its theological first principles. But that is not the sort of need I am talking about. I mean that men need an image, single, colored, and clear in outline, an image to be called up instantly in the imagination. When what is Catholic is to be distinguished from what claims to be Christian, or even, in one sense, is Christian. Now, I can scarcely remember a time when the image of Our Lady did not stand up in my mind quite definitely, at the mention of the thought of all these things. I was quite distant from these things, and then doubtful about these things, and then disputing with the world for them, and with myself against them, for that is a condition before conversion. But whether the figure was distant or was dark and mysterious, or was a scandal to my contemporaries, or was a challenge to myself, I never doubted that this figure was the figure of the faith, that she embodied as a complete human being, still only human, all that this thing had to say to humanity. The instant I remembered the Catholic Church, I remembered her. When I tried to forget the Catholic Church, I tried to forget her. When I finally saw her, what was nobler than my fate, the freest and the hardest of all my acts of freedom, it was in front of a gilded and very gaudy little image of her in the port of Brinzi, that I promised the thing that I would do if I returned to my own land.